I'm Matt Hopcraft and I'm presenting this evident research project on stress and burnout in Australian dental practitioners. Just a standard disclaimer that this presentation was uh, based on data that was collected as part of evident research project 28 and the information in this presentation is my opinion. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a number of people and particularly the Black Dog Institute who are leaders in mental health research, both in Australia and internationally. And I've drawn a lot of information in this presentation from their work. I'd also like to acknowledge the research team who've been working on this project with me, Professor Gordon Parker in particular, who was the founder of the Black Dog Institute. He's the head of psychiatry at uh, the University of New South Wales and director of psychiatry at the Prince of Wales Hospital. Dr. Roisin McGrath from the University of Melbourne and Dr. Nicole Storman from the University of Queensland. The Evident Foundation, obviously, uh, and PSA Insurance, who were uh, financial supporters of this project. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about burnout, why it's important, what we found in this project, looking at burnout, but a number of other mental health issues. And then, you know, what I think the next steps will be. I think this is what a lot of people are feeling right now, whether it's health professionals like us, it's teachers, it's parents, it's people in hospitality. I think everyone is really just kind of over this pandemic and COVID cases are increasing again, mortality is rising. Um, and so we're not out of the woods yet. And to a large extent, you know, we would expect this. It's been a very rocky road, um, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, and depending on where you're from, experiencing long periods of lockdowns, of curfews, limits to movement, social contact with others. It, it has been a really tough couple of years. And so for many people, that image on the screen resonates really strongly, a feeling that the battery's in the red zone and it's been in the red zone for a long time, we are exhausted, we're drained, and we're not able to recharge. And broadly, what this slide describes is what we would commonly refer to as burnout. Now, at the core of well being and of burnout is our response to stress. And our automatic response to stress is fight or flight. It's an adaptive response that's perfected over tens of thousands of years and it's designed to protect us from harm. So, initially, increasing stress actually increases our performance. And there's a point where there's an optimum amount of stress and it puts us in a comfort zone where we can continue to operate and we perform really, really well. But when the stress goes above that comfort zone or when it's there for an extended period of time, that's when we start to see fatigue and exhaustion and impaired performance set in. And if we don't address that, Pro prolonged and chronic stress can lead to structural and functional changes inside the brain um, that can change, can play a role in the development of or trigger a number of physical and mental illnesses. So we think of things like depression and anxiety, but also hypertension and cardiovascular disease and sleeping problems. And the question is, well, how much stress is too much? And it really depends because something that might not be stressful for one person, constantly working 10, 12 hours a day, might be really difficult for other people. So there's a context around stress, but where stress starts to become a real problem for most people is when it's constant, when there's no let up, when there's no ability to, to rest and take a break. And there's a common misconception that there's a direct correlation between stress levels and mental health and an assumption that if we want to improve our mental health, then all we need to do is reduce stress. Um, and this is particularly so for mental health at work and work-related stress. So we think, well, if we reduce our work-related stress, we're going to be fine. But the research tells us that the factors that affect mental health are complex, they're interlinked, and it's not just a simple stress mental health relationship. So our mental health is impacted by a range of individual home, workplace factors, our relationships, and so on. That said, managing stress at work is an important part of well-being because as we saw on that previous slide, if stress levels remain high for extended periods, then we do risk becoming exhausted and unwell. So what's burnout? And before we discuss perhaps what burnout is, it's important to understand what burnout isn't because burnout's not considered to be a mental illness and it doesn't mean that you're going to become mentally unwell and it's not a sign of weakness. So it doesn't mean that you don't have what it takes to be a, a healthcare worker and it's not a sign of failure or a sign of a lack of resilience. Um, it's also important not to confuse burnout with moral injury. So moral injury where people feel a sense of 
personal harm because their work conflicts with their moral compass. So they're wanting to provide care to help people and they're unable to do that or to confuse it with compassion fatigue, which is an overload of compassion, which is common in healthcare workers. I think it's also important to recognize that burnout is much more common than you might think. And we'll see that in some of the data shortly. Uh, a lot of health professions are experiencing these feelings at the moment. And the reality is that most of us are going to experience at least some of the symptoms of burnout at some stage throughout our career. Now, that's not to say that we're all going to eventually suffer from burnout. But as we see, there are certain aspects of being a healthcare worker that predispose us to the risk of burnout. So as with everything, raising our awareness and understanding of burnout is the first step in helping us to address this problem. Now, it is important for us to note that burnout at the moment is considered an occupational phenomenon and not a medical condition. Uh, and that goes to the point I made about burnout at the moment not considered to be a mental illness. Now, some of the work that uh, Gordon Parker and I are working on at the moment um, is, is you know, kind of really looking into that space a little bit more. But the international classification of diseases doesn't have burnout as a, as an, as a psychiatric disorder or as, a, as an illness. Um, and it focus is really predominantly on work-related stress, although some of that, that emerging evidence sort of points to the fact that there are people who aren't in the workplace who can still be burnt out. Um, and we don't say that it's not a mental illness because we don't want to, um, you know, have the, a level of stigma attached to it. There is a st still stigma attached to it, and it's important that we try and destigmatize some of these issues around mental health. Um, it's just perhaps to better understand uh, where it's coming from. Typically, burnout's classified as a, as a condition caused by workplace stress and having three dimensions, uh, emotional exhaustion, disengagement, and a reduced sense of personal accomplishment. And it's usually measured uh, with a tool that assesses it in these three dimensions. Some of the work that we've done with Gordon um, and that we won't go into here, we'll, we'll bring out later, um, looks at a different set of measures for burnout that starts to bring in some, some other dimensions about work capability and so on. Um, but these are, these are commonly um, sort of assessed measures in burnout. So you feel like you can't meet all of the responsibilities of your role. You feel like you've got nothing left to give. If you feel despondent about your future in healthcare, and that's a particular problem for people who've entered the profession because they want to help others. Because most healthcare workers we know join the profession because they're caring people. They want their work to be meaningful and they want to make a difference. And if that purpose isn't being met, then some people might start to feel ineffective um, and a lack of accomplishment then results. And there's an inverse relationship between the time that we spend on meaningful work and the risk of burnout. So healthcare workers who spend less time on work they consider meaningful to them tend to have higher rates of burnout. A burnout has some common signs and we'll, we'll flick through some of those. And it's possible that you are experiencing some of these signs during periods of stress, but that doesn't mean that you have burnout. But if you do notice that these signs uh, are occurring often and that you're feeling emotionally overloaded, then that might be a, a signal that um, you're experiencing burnout. So those common symptoms include things like exhaustion, the, the feeling fatigued, tired, lethargy, feeling drained. Anxiety, so it's being stressed or worried, overwhelmed, the inability to switch off, you're worried about work when you're not at work, you've got a sense of dread about going into work the next day, sometimes a sense of indifference, so it's a lack of empathy, no interest or pleasure in work or even in activities outside of work, so you, you've got a sense of cynicism or apathy, you're not engaged, you just kind of feel like you're going through the motions. Uh, sometimes it's depression, so a low mood or sadness, a feeling of hopelessness or feeling helpless, lowered self-worth, and in some situations, perhaps even suicidal thoughts. Um, irritability and anger are also common symptoms, with the most frequent descriptions being irritability, impatience, frustration, anger, or resentment. Sleep disturbance is common, and that can be either a lack of sleep or too much sleep, so either ends of that, of that spectrum. A lack of motivation or passion, so experienced as uh, just a lack of satisfaction in life or work, uh, feeling like you're not making a difference, that the work just doesn't have any purpose for you anymore. You've lost that passion for work. 
Sometimes it's cognitive problems. It's a lack of concentration or attention. Your memory is impacted. You've got a brain fog or cloudy thinking, difficulty planning or making decisions. Um, there can be impaired work performance, so a decreased productivity, a reduced output, the quality of your work, making more mistakes, avoiding responsibility or procrastinating. For some people, they become asocial, they cocoon themselves up, they withdraw from family or friends or from colleagues. Some people experience physical symptoms, so body aches or headaches, uh, eating appetite changes, nausea or a low libido. Uh, and some people experience emotional lability. So they feel fragile, increased sensitivity, they have emotional outbursts and they feel more tearful. So what we did in this study was we rolled out a, a survey of dental practitioners from October to December last year uh, across Australia, open to all dental practitioners, all registered dental practitioners. Uh, and we've got results from 1,483 uh, people, which represents about 8% of all registered practitioners. So it's, it's reasonably representative of, of the population out there, notwithstanding that um, you know, perhaps it, it tends to overestimate some of the problems given the way that people respond to surveys. So we'll walk through a couple of the measures. And the first one that we're looking at here is psychological distress. So a focus on anxiety and depressive symptoms that people experienced in the four weeks prior to filling out the survey. And about 30 to 35% of participants reported moderate to severe levels of psychological distress. For dentists and specialists, it was a little bit lower for those who worked across the public and the private sector compared to those who worked uh, in the public sector alone. And it was certainly a little bit higher for oral health therapists, hygienists, therapists, and, and dental prosthetists. The next was a measure of minor or more severe non-psychotic psychiatric morbidity. So another measure looking at symptoms over the past couple of weeks and really high levels of distress around about 60% across the board, um, regardless of kind of really the practitioner type or that practice setting. We asked questions about diagnosed anxiety and depression and whether they had a current diagnosis or whether it was something that they'd previously experienced. So for dentists and specialists, around about 10 to 12% with anxiety or depression currently, uh, around about 20 to 25% had ever had a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. For the hygienists, the oral health therapists um, and the therapists, uh, you know, sort of around 15, 16% with depression, nearly 20% with anxiety currently, and more than 30% who'd previously had a diagnosis of anxiety or depression. And for the prosthetists, reasonably low levels of anxiety currently, but around 15% with depression and 20% previously with a diagnosis of, um, of anxiety and more than 45% with a previous diagnosis of depression. So, you know, reasonably high levels of anxiety and depression across the, the profession. One of the factors that, that we looked at, and one of the things that the research tells us is that there's a strong link between um, perfectionism and, and burnout in particular. And so on a perfectionism scale here, we can see that more than 85% of the, of the population reported distinctly perfectionist tendencies. And most people sat in the, in the um, moderately perfectionist to distinctly perfectionist category. Very few people in the not perfectionist category at all. And even in that distinctly perfectionist group, you can see most people sitting at the top end of that scale. And that's probably not a surprise, very high levels of perfectionism in our profession. Um, but that's a really strong driver of burnout. And so if we look at burnout, and we measured burnout a couple of different ways, um, but this is, this is using kind of the standard burnout measure so that we could compare to other, other studies. And what we're looking at here is a comparison to another study that Natasha Smallwood and her colleagues did in frontline healthcare workers uh, across Australia last year in the, in the purple. Um, and the dentists in blue, the dental specialists in yellow and the hygienists, oral health therapists and therapists in green. And you can see that there's really similar levels of burnout across the emotional exhaustion scale, the personal accomplishment scale and the depersonalization scale. So what we're seeing in burnout in our profession is very similar to what was being reported across Australian frontline healthcare workers at a similar sort of period last year.
And then finally, we asked a question about um, thoughts of suicide in the past 12 months. And one in six participants, so around about 18%, um, said that they'd thought about taking their own life in the preceding 12 months. And there was actually a, a higher proportion who'd previously had those thoughts. So at any time um, in their lives had thought about taking their lives and 5.6% had reported that they'd ever actually made an attempt to take their own life. And across all of the different measures that we looked at, so anxiety or depression, the psychiatric morbidity, psychiatric morbidity psychological distress, um, resilience, burnout, or people who had a, a moderate or high level of alcohol consumption, there were much higher rates of people reporting suicide ideation um, than, than the converse. So um, what we can see here is sort of that, that confluence of some of these mental health problems um, and how they all tend to interact with each other. So next steps, I, I think what the study has highlighted for us is that there are really high levels of stress, of burnout and of mental health issues in our dental profession. And they're as, as high as other health professions and perhaps higher in some of these measures as well. There's no doubt that the pandemic's likely to have had an impact on that, but I suspect that there's some underlying um, baseline levels of, of mental health problems that existed before the pandemic. And I think it's important for us to continue to do these studies over time to monitor what happens, to see whether um, we do bounce back post the pandemic or whether there is ongoing issues. And I think what it's particularly highlighted for us and one of the reasons that we set out to do this study in the first place is to quantify the problems so that we can then really focus on well-being and support for practitioners moving forward from here because this paints a picture for us that, that there are some problems that we need to be addressing. This research couldn't have been done without the generous support of the Evident Foundation and obviously of PSA Insurance as well. Um, the Evident Foundation relies on the support of dentists and others in the community. So please think about donating to the Evident Foundation to help support future research projects like this. And if you're interested in being involved in practice-based research, then go to evident.org.au for more information. Thanks.